I guess I'm just in the habit of inflaming two sides of petty arguments because today I'm answering the question of should you invest in primes or zooms. Stick around for the end of the video because I'll close by speculating if it even matters anymore. If you're a photography veteran, you already know what you like. So I hope you'll help me fill in the gaps in the comment section for the new ladies and gentlemen who will probably find this window. There are three kinds of informed buyers in my opinion, the collector, the performance, and the convenience mindset. If you're a convenient mindset, you might be a zoomer or a boomer. They like to take it easy after years of shooting film, you feel me? Traditionally, zooms have generally been bigger, heavier, less sharp, less contrasty, less quick, less everything than primes, though we will address this later. The trade-off was always performance, aperture, pixel peeping, optical quality, in exchange for versatility and convenience. For example, the 24 to 70 versus a portrait session, you can get the whole scene horizontal first, go vertical for a head-to-toe shot, zoom in for a waist up and chest up, and zoom in even more for a headshot or a face shot. Combine this with side to side motion of middle composition and left and right side rule of thirds and you just knocked out 18 unique looking shots without moving your body an inch. Maximized output for effort. Typically zooms are also always going to cost more than standard primes because their optical designs are way more complex so keep that in mind. Always rent before you buy. Also if you're an event shooter zooms are going to be a very dear friend. The proof is in the pudding. Ask any wedding photographer. I think many if not most wedding photographers will probably take a prime lens, but they'll also take the entire trinity of zooms from wide zoom to mid-range to telephoto. Now, if you're the performance mindset, then you might be a primer. I have no joke for that one. Traditionally, standard primes have been lighter, smaller, faster focusing with better optical quality and wider apertures. Even with those points, generally they come in with a cheaper price tag. Why? Well, they've existed since day one of photography and the concept is proven. They are way easier to make and they have less glass elements and really just less material overall. The optical quality was generally attributed to having less glass to sandwich your light before hitting the film or the sensor, resulting in better saturation and sharpness, more clarity, blah, blah, blah. Introduce autofocus and it's just less glass that's moving around, making prime lenses faster, typically. Wider apertures would make tougher lighting situations easier, allowing you to shoot at a lower ISO for a cleaner image, and it opens up creative opportunities with depth of field. All of this in exchange for having to move around a lot more while you're shooting, and you have to bring more lenses to the field, so the weight benefit of prime lenses just got destroyed. Maximized image quality. And exercise, not fitness advice. I am not a registered dietitian or fitness trainer. I should add that throughout my photography career, prime lenses being generally cheaper to make has led to some serious lenses that come with a serious price. But with the cost floor being inherently lower, the price you paid for some exotic primes would seriously have melted your face with all of that financial room to give you every optical technicality that you could possibly think of. In my time, the best lenses ever made have been primes. The legendary Nikon 200 F2. That lens is super darned expensive, but if that kind of optical quality was even possible in a zoom, the price would probably be close to five figures. Next, we have the collector. What about the collector? Z well, you have everything already, so moving on. To my ears, primes always sounded like a better option because I generally will take any burden in exchange for the best optical output that I can get. However, while the argument still stands between prime and zoom lovers, Nikon has kind of destroyed this argument. And if you haven't tried a wide variety of Nikon Z mount glass, you might not have realized this. Wait, let me know in the comments if you prefer taking a couple of primes or one zoom into the field. Also, if this video gets 100 likes, I'll spin my brand new prize wheel. It'll happen on the following Friday night live stream. I'll choose one subscriber at random after we hit 100 likes and I'll spin that wheel. There's one awesome prize valued at $100, a bunch of funny prizes, and even a $25 B&H photo gift card. I'll pay for shipping if it's within mainland United States. As I was saying, Nikon has pretty much ruined the zoom versus prime argument. Their Z mount optics are so good that it's very difficult to see a difference in any of the perks that we used to see in primes. Be on the lookout because I have videos in the hopper right now that are scheduled that are comparing Nikon Z mount zooms versus primes and I don't think you're going to want to miss that. There's a caveat with Z mount lenses though, with the exception of a few, 
they don't offer the character that existed back whenever zooms versus prime did matter. I've said before that lenses in general just aren't as fun as they used to be, but by and large, this is kind of a good thing if you have the editing chops to fake those characteristics that you've been missing. Think of Z lenses, zooms and primes as an insanely high quality tool in which to sculpt your creative artistic desires with. So are there really any pros and cons left to zoom versus primes? Optically? Not really, but you can more easily make a decision now. So in the comments, tell me what matters to you, weight, size, price, or aperture. You're getting a savage lens with Nikon Z mount regardless. I'm Z Wade, DZ Wade, and Z Wade Photo. Stay sharp, YouTube.